midst of a series called The Road to Recovery. And uh, we started it uh, two weeks ago. This is sermon number three. Don't have a lot of time to go back and review what we did in session one and session two. It is on the website. You can go and listen to it uh, if you would like. But we're going to get uh, started today. We're looking at the word recovery. R-E-C-O-V-E-R-Y. It's an acrostic. The first R in recovery stands for realize I'm not God. You and I have a tendency to try to play God in our own world with our own lives and the lives of those around us. And if you're going to experience recovery, if you're going to go from stuck to starting over, if you're going to give Jesus permission to climb any mountain, tear down any wall, and destroy any lie that we just sung about, we have to begin with the realization we are not God. The first E in recovery stands for earnestly believe that God exists. Since I realize I'm not God, I need to put my faith in the one who is God and realize that I matter to this God who does exist. And this is the hope step because he has the strength and the power to help me recover. And today we are going to look at step three. I read several years ago in, a, I believe, a Chuck Swindoll book, a story about a pet store delivery truck that was going down the road. And every time it came to a stoplight, the driver jumped out of the truck, took a two-by-four, and banged all the way around the back of the truck. Did this at one stop? Did it at the second stop? Did it at the third stop? Nobody could figure out what this crazy truck driver was doing. Finally, at the fourth stop, somebody yelled at him, Hey, why are you beating your truck? The guy yelled back, This is only a two-ton truck. I'm carrying four tons of canaries. I've got to keep half of them in the air at the same time. <laughs> when I read that, I thought, Wow, that sounds a lot like life, doesn't it? You and I got a two-ton life, and we're carrying four tons of burdens and trouble and difficulties and challenges, and we're trying to keep half of them up in the air at any given time. We're beating ourselves up, and we're trying to keep from crashing down. You see, we have a tendency in the human race, and that is to get stuck in segments of our life. We get stuck in relationships we should have never started we get stuck with habits that turn into destructive behavior. We get stuck in a, in a difficult period of grief because we've lost a loved one. We get stuck in our anger. We get stuck in our work. We get stuck in inappropriate sexual relationships. And once we get stuck, then an avalanche of things begin to happen to us. It starts with feeling guilty because we're stuck. We say things like, I wished I could get out of this, but I just can't seem to do it. And we feel guilty for getting there in the first place. And then when we have a lot of guilt and it mounts up over a period of time and we don't think we can get out of it and change, that guilt turns into something else. It becomes anger. We get mad and we say, I ought to be able to change. But we don't. And after we get mad for a while, we then become fearful. Fearful that we're never going to get out of this mess. Fearful that it's going to control me for the rest of my life. Fearful that I'm going to end up in a hospital or worse yet, a, a cemetery. And when we stay fearful long enough, it turns to depression. And we go deeper into sorrow for ourselves, and we have a pity party and at the end of the party, we simply resign. We resign to the fact, I'm always going to be stuck. And then we start the cycle all over again. Guilt, anger, fear, depression, resignation. So how do we move? How do we move from stuck to starting over? It's what we've been looking at the last couple of weeks. Number one, admit I've got a problem. Reality step, I'm not God. Step two, hope step. Not only am I powerless to change, but God does have the power and he's willing to give it to me so that we can change. He knows my problems. He cares about me. He knows everything going on in my life. He's offering himself to me to produce change. That's the step of hope. But you see, it's not enough to know that God is available. Hope is a good thing. 
Hope, I believe, has a significant purpose in our lives. The purpose of hope is to lead us from stuck to the point of decision to start over. Hope sees change in the future. As believers, we say we have a hope in what? Heaven. That when this world is over, all of its ugliness will be over. And man, we're going to a place of perfection. God not only gives us hope for that future, but God gives us hope for a future here that we can see a glimmer of light and we'll be willing to make a decision to move towards that light. But, but, but just having, just seeing the hope is not enough. We've got to choose it. We've got to make a decision. That's step number three. Consciously choose to commit all of my life and my will to Christ's care and control. Consciously choose. This is the C in recovery. R-E-C. Consciously choose to commit all my life and my will to Christ's care and control. And this step is based on the words of Jesus himself found in the Gospel of Matthew chapter 11. Many of you have memorized this verse at some point in your life. Jesus extends an invitation for us to make a decision about. Jesus says, come to me, all of you who are what? Weary, tired, overburdened, heavy laden. Come to me, all of you who are stuck. And I will give you what? Is there a more beautiful word in the human vocabulary than that four-letter word? Rest. Come to me. Not because you're physically tired, but because you're emotionally drained. Come to me not because you've worked too hard and you need a nap. Come to me because you're despondent and depressed. Have no idea what to do next. Come to me because your mind won't shut down. It continues to race with thoughts that keep me awake, that keep me in turmoil, that keep me troubled. Jesus says, come to me. And then we have a choice. Come to me, that's hope. There's someone who wants us to come to him. But, but the invitation won't move you from stuck to starting over. You've got to choose to accept. You've got to RSVP the invitation. That's not the only invitation that he gives to us, though. He says, come and take. Come, take, choose. If you do that, the promise in this passage is he'll give us relief. He'll give us release. He'll provide for us rest. And we will have rejuvenation. I don't know about you, but I like the sound of the word rejuvenation much better than I do resignation. But too often we end up at resignation and God offers us rejuvenation. That's the invitation. What a deal. Why would anybody turn down that invitation? Why would anybody not RSVP? Yet some of you haven't. You've heard it before. You've heard it more than once. And you keep coming back. Why? I don't know. Because the message is always the same. It's an invitation of Jesus. He wants control of your life, but he won't demand it. It's, a, it's an invitation. It's kind of like somebody giving you a gift and you leave it sitting on your kitchen table unopened. Some of you have heard the message before and you've acted on it. You've, you've opened the gift. And then you've committed that heinous error of forgetting to remember. You've, you've developed a, a new habit, a new problem, a new crisis. And you have forgotten how you got out of the last one. And you're stuck again. It's a dangerous thing when we forget to remember the principles that we have once allowed to be functional in our lives. You see, God says, I want to give you the gift of relief and release and recovery and rejuvenation, but you've done nothing about it. What is it that keeps us from taking this third very important step? What causes us to procrastinate giving our problems to God and delay surrendering our life to his care and his control? 
I'm going to suggest to you five things. Five things that keep us. There may be more, but we're going to highlight five today that keep us from doing this. They're pride, guilt, fear, worry, and doubt. Pride, guilt, fear, worry, and doubt. Why don't you say those with me, okay? Pride, guilt, fear, worry, doubt. We're going to take a close look at each one of those. Not a long look, but a close look. The first one is pride. Pride will keep me from admitting that I am need help. Here's what the wisest man, Solomon, uh, wrote in that uh, book of very pithy sayings called Proverbs. In chapter 18, verse 12, the wisest man who ever lived said this, arrogant people are on their way to ruin because they won't admit they need help. Did you hear how the wisest man who ever lived defined people who won't admit they need help? He said, you're arrogant. Let me illustrate. How many men in this room refuse to stop and ask for directions? <laughs> and and, and here's, here's the problem. We don't want to even admit that we are lost. <laughs> but men are not the only ones with a problem. Arrogant people are on their way to ruin because they won't admit they need help. That wise man said in chapter 10, verse 18 of the book of Proverbs, the self-sufficient fool. He's not pulling any punches, is he? Arrogant people, self-sufficient fools fall flat on their face. Maybe you're not ready to take this step. Maybe you're not ready to say, I give control and care of my life to Christ. I'm not ready to do that yet. I still want to play God of my own circumstances. So, so here's what you need. If, you, if you're at that point in life that you're not ready to take this step, then what you need is a greater dose of pain. This is a review of last week. God, that is God. Answer him. And what he's going to tell you is, would you stand and quote the Lord's Prayer? <laughs> God, God, God will gladly allow pain in our life in order to get attention. One of the principles we looked at last week was God's antidote for denial is pain. Most people will not change just because they see the light of a truth. We change when we feel the pain of our problem. Second word that keeps us from making this decision is guilt. First one was pride. Second one, guilt. Guilt keeps us from taking this step. We may be too ashamed to ask God to help us. The father of the wisest man who ever lived, King David, wrote in Psalm 40, 13, problems Far too big for me to solve or piled higher than my head. Meanwhile, my sins are too many to count and they have caught up with me. And listen to this, and I am ashamed to look up. Do, do you ever remember having a conversation with your kids when they were little, they'd misbehaved, and you have them standing in front of you? Did you ever have to say, look your dad in the eye? Because all they would do is look down, shame, embarrassment, guilt. It was too big. They didn't want to look you in the eye. They wouldn't look up. King David, after his sin with Bathsheba, said, I'm like a little child in the presence of God. I don't want to look up. You ever feel that way? Did, did, did you maybe show up? here today feeling that way. I'm ashamed to look up. I don't want to ask God to help me again. Do you know how many times I've already asked him? Do you know how many times I've already made the promise, God, if you bail me out, I'll never do it again. And I've done it again and again and again. I cannot look up. I'm too embarrassed. God won't listen to me again. Oh, you are wrong. There is no sin that God cannot forgive. There is no sin that God has not forgiven. 
Don't let pride or guilt keep you from taking this step. He wants to forgive your sin, and more importantly, he wants to remove the guilt of your sin. That's what Paul wrote about in the book of Romans. There is therefore now no what? Condemnation. Don't keep feeling guilty over past sins that have been forgiven. That's how Satan keeps a hold of us and keeps us down. He points to our past. And you have to remember, all of our past is covered under the blood of Jesus Christ. Remembered no more. Forgiven and forgotten by a God who doesn't forget anything. Remember the end of the movie Braveheart, William Wallace? He's being tortured. He's on the rack. Nakeen wants him and his people to give in to his power and his rule, but Wallace suffers through it. He won't give in. And the very last word that he shouts as he marshals all of his strength is freedom. Yeah. I have to believe that the directors of that movie must have had in their mind the vision of Jesus hanging on the cross after shedding his blood. And Jesus shouts out, it is finished. Jesus could have easily have shouted freedom. For what was finished was the bondage of our sin. We were set free by what Jesus did for us. Freedom from our sins and from the guilt that they carry. Bruce Wilkerson, a, a, an author, wrote in one of his books, sexual immorality is a threshold sin. I'd never heard that term before, threshold sin. And quite, quite frankly, I will suggest to you that not only sexual immorality is a threshold sin, but Quite frankly, all sin is a threshold sin. We stand in a doorway, and there's a choice to make, and there's different things on each side of the door. Depends on which way we choose. But he illustrates it this way. He says on one side of the threshold is immorality, and on the other side is purity. I would suggest to you, if you're thinking about telling a lie, on one side of the doorway is truth, and on the other side of the doorway is falsehood. Believers who are bondage to immorality find that unless they experience victory in this area, they will not grow in holiness or serve the Lord with passion and power. And I will suggest to you, whatever sin has root in your life, it is that which will prevent you from further spiritual growth and maturity. Third word that keeps us from making this step is fear. Being afraid. I'm afraid of what I might have to give up. Most of you have heard the classic story of the guy that falls off the cliff. He's halfway down and there's a branch sticking out and he's able to reach over and grab and hang on for dear life. He looks down. It's 500 feet to the bottom. He looks up. 500 feet to the top. He's right stuck in the middle. And he cries out, somebody help! God hears him. And he hears the voice of God. This is the Lord. Trust me. Let go and I'll catch you. The gentleman looks down and he looks up and then he says, is there anybody else up there? <laughs> you see, he's afraid to let go. He's hanging on for dear life by that branch and he's simply saying, you know, this isn't so bad after all. I'm doing good right here. Fear keeps him from letting go. What are you afraid of if you commit your life to Christ? What are you afraid is going to happen to you if, if, if you give control of your life to the care of God? Do, do you think he's going to turn you into a nun? Actually, quite frankly, it's too late for most of you, so don't worry about that one. M might he turn you into a pastor? Oh, he could. You know, he's called pastors at 80, so, you know, most of you would still qualify. But you say, I don't want anybody controlling me. Who are you kidding? We, we all are being controlled by various things at different times. It's just what we, it's just when we choose Christ, we choose who's in control. But, but how many of you are controlled by your hurts? Hurts of what you've been through. And they control your decisions and your emotions and your thoughts. How many of you are controlled by your circumstances? How many of you are controlled by the people that you hang out with? You know what real freedom is? I believe freedom is choosing who you give control to. 
And when you give your life in the care and control of Christ, he says he will set us free. Those who, who sin are slaves to sin, the Bible says. But if you know the truth, the truth will set you free. Some of you are old enough in here to remember um, um, a guy who made his living singing who couldn't sing. His name was Bob Dylan. <laughs> Had the privilege of meeting Bob Dylan on occasion. Yeah, Bob Dylan, you know, got into some trouble. And uh, at a point in his life, he said he gave his life to Christ. And I've kind of followed up on him in recent years. I'm not sure he still is hanging with that life-transforming decision that he made. But there was three or four years, uh, he recorded two, two Christian albums, two faith-based albums. And one of the key hallmark songs that he wrote at that time was, You Gotta Serve Somebody. I don't know if you remember that. But it was about this dichotomy in his life of when he lived for himself and fried his brain. And, and then he came to the end of himself and looked towards Christ. And he said, you're, you're going to serve somebody. Who are you going to choose to serve? Your ego, yourself, your problems, or Christ? How does a man benefit how does a person benefit if you gain the entire world but you lose your soul in the process? Is anything worth more than your soul? Anything more eternal than your soul? Nah. But when you take this third step, you give up everything and you never had it so good because God takes what you've given him, he turns it around, he adds new meaning, new significance, new vitality, and he gives it back to you in a whole new way. If you've been afraid to open up your life to his care and control, that he might make you some fanatic, some nut, or some whatever that you can imagine, don't worry. He's going to make you the best version of you that you could ever imagine. If you focus, and, 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 and quite frankly, at this decision, we, what we often do is instead of looking at the choice, we look at the specifics. To, don't worry about the specifics yet. If you focus on the specifics, you'll never make this most important decision, which is a step to recovery. Just come to God and say, God, I don't even know what I want to give up, but I do know I want my life under your control. So here's a blank check. Do with me what you want. Fourth problem. Worry will keep us from taking this step. You see, often we confuse the decision-making phase with the problem solving phase. Uh, some of you might remember back in 1963 when JFK was president and he announced publicly, we're going to put a man on the moon. When he made that statement, when he made that decision, did he have all the problems worked out on how you were going to get a man from earth to the moon? He did not. But if you're a good manager, you know that you never confuse decision making with problem solving. If you, if you confuse them, you never make decisions. You have to make the decision and then you figure out the process to the problems. Kennedy said we're going to the moon and then it was Nassau's problem to figure out the solutions. I suggest to you in the spiritual life, it's very similar. You and I make the decision to surrender our lives, our hurts, habits, and hangups to Jesus. And then it's up to Jesus to figure out the solutions to our hurts, habits, and hang-ups. A couple of months ago, Shelly and I made a decision to remodel our backyard. Uh, the only regret I had when we sold the house in the country and we moved in here, and you all have heard that story before, it wasn't planned, it was a God thing, the way he just kind of worked everything out. And the only regret I've had in the move is I missed my backyard. I loved the backyard in the country. Um, Shelly had helped design it. Bob Prieto helped us put it in. And I spent a lot of time in the backyard. I hated this backyard. It was a foo-foo backyard. Um, sometimes things are better left unsaid. And I, 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 it, was, it was. It was just, I, I never went back there. In fact, I had a small piece of cement poured in my front yard so I could sit in my front yard rather than go in my backyard. Um, and so, anyway, we, we decided a couple of months ago we, we were going to do that. And so, uh, that was the decision-making process. Uh, the decision really was not that difficult. But was making the decision to change our backyard, was that all that was involved in this transaction? No. You see, after we made the decision, we then had to figure out 
how big's the patio going to be and where do the walkways go and what kind of plants are we going to put in? Are, are we going to put in real grass or since I have a son who sells synthetic turf, are we going to put in fake grass, all right? Depends on how good he is to his father. <laughs> but you see, the, the, the problems are after the decision. And, and quite frankly, do you know how it looks right now? It looks worse. It looks like a battle zone. And that's often the way our lives will look when we first come to Jesus. Because you see, you gotta, it, it takes a little while to get the old crap I didn't do that, that, that didn't filter that one. Uh, the old stuff out <laughs> to make room for the new stuff. And that's true in our own lives. We invite Jesus in. It takes a while for him to work through, get the old out and the new in and functional. This might be the most important thing I will say today, and I've got to hurry up and say the rest of it. The Christian life is a decision followed by a process. It's not once and done. It's once and saved, but it's a process after that. It's daily choices after that. And, and around New Hope, we have multiple ways to assist folks in the process. If you're new here, fill out one of those cards and we'll send you all the options that we have. But we have things like Operation Timothy, one-on-one -on -one Bible studies. We have group Bible studies for women, group Bible studies for men. We have small group Bible studies. We have, we have Celebrate Recovery. All of these designed and made available so that you and I can become all that God wants us to be. That's what we're talking about today is, is getting to first base. In World War II, the Marines had a definite strategy they used in the Pacific when they wanted to retake the Pacific from the Japanese. They used the same strategy on every island and everything I've read says they succeeded every single time. Here's the first thing the Marines would do. They would go to an island that had been taken captive and they would start bombing it and they would pelt it with grenades and all kinds of explosives. This was called the softening up period. Some of you might be here today and you're in that softening up period. You feel like your world is exploding. There's all kinds of explosions going off and you feel like your life is in fragments and you're saying, life is not working for me. You come to a point to where you say, yes, I need something beyond myself. Your pride has been softened up to a point you can say, I need help. The second phase that the Marines used at that time is they would come in after they had softened it up and then they would establish a beachhead. It might only be 20 yards deep and 200 yards wide, but they would get a presence on the island. And when they had established the beachhead, they had, they, had they completely liberated the island at that moment? No. They had just gotten there. From there they began to fight small skirmishes and battles. And sometimes they would move a hundred yards at a time. Sometimes they would get pushed back a little ways. Other times they would win significant ground. But everybody knew that once a beachhead was established, total liberation of the island was inevitable. Just a matter of time. And in the history of World War II, once the Marines had landed and established a beachhead, they never lost an island. It was a matter of time. When you make this step to choose Christ, what's going to happen is God gets a beachhead into your life. The Bible calls it conversion, being born again. It just means that God now has established presence and place in your life. Does that mean everything becomes perfect instantaneously? Absolutely not. But it means you've got God in your life and he's got a beachhead. And from there, he's going to conquer more and more territory in your life. When my children were younger, and we needed to cross a busy street, I'd grab hold of their hands because I wanted them to stay safe. I didn't want them to run off on their own and run into to trouble and run into traffic. No matter how much they wanted to let go and go their own way, I, I, I held on because I love them. There are times in our life that we make decisions. God, I, I don't think I want to follow you right now. It's a little difficult holding up my ethics and, and God, I want to do this on my own. God loves us too much, so don't let us go. The Bible says to Timothy, as Paul wrote, he is able to keep that which I've committed to him until that day. 
God says, I do the holding on so you don't have to worry about it. Whatever God asks of me to do, he enables me to accomplish it. Philippians 1, 6, God who began a good work in you will keep on helping you till you grow in his grace until he finishes the work. How you doing with worry when you play God? Who's holding whose hands as you cross the busy intersection of decision and direction in your life? Last step, last problem, doubt will keep you from taking this step. Do you understand that Satan has a plan for your life just as Christ does? Satan has a plan for you. And his plan looks like this. Doubt to make you question God's word and God's goodness. Discouragement to make you look at your problems rather than at God. Diversion to make wrong things seem right and attractive. Defeat to make you feel like a failure so you'll never try again. And delay to keep you paralyzed by doubt so you'll never do anything. Some of you are saying, Tim, I've tried this step before. I've tried giving my life to God and it just didn't work for me. I, I don't know each of your circumstances individually. But I would suggest there's probably a common denominator with just about everybody who makes that statement. And my evaluation would be that you probably didn't fully understand what was involved in this relationship with Christ. It, in fact, what you, you did is you wanted to be involved, but you didn't want to be committed. Big difference between involvement and commitment. It's kind of like the kamikaze pilot. Everybody here know what a kamikaze pilot is? It's kind of like a kamikaze pilot that I read about once. He went on 33 missions. <laughs> you got to think about that one a minute, don't you? He was involved, <laughs> but he was not committed. Let me, uh, let me wrap this up. How do I get committed? How do I take this step? It's not complicated. Uh, I've learned to say it's not easy, but it's simple. Because it's not easy to, over, to put aside my pride. It's not easy to push away the fear. It's not easy to override the doubt. It's not easy to push away guilt. So how do I take this step? Number one, I accept God's Son as my Savior. Believe in the Lord Jesus, confess with thy mouth, you will be saved. Period. That simple. That's good enough. Number two, accept God's word as my standard for living. See, a lot of people want to accept the person, but they don't want to accept his truth. If you don't accept his truth, you, you don't get the person. Because he says, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. He's a package deal. Okay? It's the way it is. Uh, God says this is the standard by how our lives are to be shaped. The scripture says all scripture is inspired by God. It's useful for teaching of faith, correcting error, and resetting the direction of a person's life. Number three, accept God's will as your strategy in life. God, do what you want to do with me. The, the first thought I try to start every day with is this. Lord, if I choose you and die to myself, what do you want to do in me, with me, and through me today? As David wrote, I delight to do your will. I seek your will first. And God's will becomes our strategy for life, even when I don't understand it. And last of all, I accept God's power as my strength. I should have clarified this with Mark, since he's the pilot. But I understand there's two ways of flying a plane. IFR and VFR. Does that sound relatively correct? Oh, I, I have another pilot over here. I should, is that re relatively accurate? Okay. Uh, IFR is instrument flight rules, and VFR is visual flight rules. And one of the things that I read says that most small aircraft crashes take place when people are doing VFR only. They're trusting their own vision, their own awareness, their own ability. Getting no help from the instruments or from whatever you call that place where people tell you where you can and can't fly. Thank you, the tower. <laughs> you don't want to fly with me at the controls. that most of them come down to a pilot who's not willing to say, I need help. 
and they trust themselves. Pretty similar to our own lives. Let me wrap up with this. God's grace is big enough for you, your hurt, your habit, your hang up, your stuck position in life. You can't be good enough to deserve it. You can't work hard enough to earn it. And you can never make enough money to buy it. It's a simple gift of grace. Charles Stanley tells a following story of his Bible seminary days. And with this, I'll close. He says, one of my more memorable seminary professors had a practical way of illustrating to students the concept of grace. At the end of his evangelism course, he would distribute the exam with the caution, read it all the way through before you beginning to answer. This caution was written at the top of the exam as well. And as we read the test, it became unquestionably clear to every one of us students that we had not studied hard enough. The further we went, the harder it got. And about halfway through, there were audible groans in the room that could be heard. On the last page, however, was a note that read, you have a choice. You can either complete the exam as given, or you can sign your name at the bottom, and in so doing, receive an A for this assignment. Wow. Many of them sat there, stunned silence. Is he serious? Sign it and get an A? Slowly the point dawned on many of us, and one by one we turned in our tits and silently filed out of the room. When I talked with my professor about it afterwards, he shared some of the reactions he had received for this procedure over the years. He said some students began to take the exam without reading all the way through, and they would sweat it out for the entire two hours of class before reaching the last page. Others would read the first two pages, become angry, turn in a blank test, storm out of the room without ever signing it. They never realized what was available, and as a result, they totally lost out. One guy, he said, however, read the entire test, including the note at the end, but he decided to take the exam anyway. He did not want any gifts. He wanted to earn his grade, and he did. He got a C-. minus. He could have easily had an A. You see, and this story illustrates many people's reactions to God's solution to their sins, habits, hurts, and hang-ups. Some people look at God's standard, his moral and ethical perfection, and they throw their hands up and surrender and said, what a waste. I never could do this. Why even try? I could never live up to all that. Others are like the student who read the test through and was aware of the professor's offer but wanted to take the test anyway, unwilling to simply receive God's gift of forgiveness. They set about to rack up enough points that they can earn it from God. But God's grace truly is like that professor's offer. It may seem unbelievable, but if we accept it, then like the stunned students who accepted the professor's offer, we will discover that God's grace is free. All we got to do is choose. Do you need to make a choice today? Do you need to get out of a place where you've been stuck for a while and start over? Do you need God to take your old and give it back to you new? He will. Or you can choose today to let your pride or your guilt or your anger or your worry or your fear keep you stuck. Choice is yours. Let's pray. Our Father, I got to be honest, there are times I wish that you would just flip a switch in the back of our head and we would just do things right. But love doesn't work that way. Love is a choice. Love is a choice that begins with whom we're going to love. And it continues as we learn the process of how to love the one we've chosen. You've made that accessible to all of us in a relationship with you. It's a gift of grace. and I pray there are those at this very moment who are going to get some fresh starts today because they don't want to be stuck forever where they are. Thank you, Father, for hearing our prayers. In Jesus' name we pray. 
Amen. Amen. God bless you. Have a great day.